you're using Twitter, how many of you here use Twitter? Whew. If you like this session, uh, a couple of key things to keep in mind. Uh, first is please do provide your feedback. It's one of the things that I look at. It's one of the things that the conference organizers look at whenever they invite new speakers and old speakers. Okay, so please do provide your feedback. Uh, be on Twitter. And that's about it for that. This session is all about clustering in 60 minutes. And I'm about to start my timer because I promised 60 minutes. Good morning. Uh, my name is Edwin. I'm a SQL Server MVP, and my key area of expertise is more on high availability and disaster recovery. Now, that does not just cover SQL Server. I'm a Windows guy. So anything Windows. IIS, SharePoint. I don't tell people. I do a lot of SharePoint, but I do a lot of SharePoint. My key area of expertise is high availability and disaster recovery. Uh, you can uh, log into my blog. Uh, Check me out on uh, Twitter. I don't tweet a lot about technology, part of my branding thing. Uh, I'm also on LinkedIn. If you have any questions in the session or after the session, you can send me an email. You can find me outside, ask questions. I'll be more than happy to answer those questions for you. And hopefully, I will be able to provide the answers that you need and you want. To start with, a uh, quick show of hands. How many of you here have some background with Windows Deliver Clustering? One, two, three. You know why are you here? <laughs> How many of you don't? Perfect. This is for you. The talk is for people who don't have any background. Now, what, what I'm going to cover basically is all about Windows Failover Clustering that applies to specifically SQL Server Failover Clustering. All right. Some of the concepts apply to always on availability groups, right? When I start to ask people about clustering, I get different feedback. Like, whew, it's so complex. There's a lot of moving parts, and it's so complicated. One of the reasons why they don't want to do clustering. And I'm happy about 50% of you guys raised your hands and said, You've done clustering, you have a bit of background. I've done the complex four, seven, eight, 16 node cluster. No. Uh, but the thing is, I totally understand how people feel about clustering when they think that it's complicated, it's complex. I mean, I can't blame them. I felt the same way. I hated clustering back in the NT4 days, Wolfpack. For those of you who know Wolfpack, uh, it only means one thing. I know how old you are. So Wolfpack was the code name for Windows NT4 clustering, Microsoft clustering services back then. But I can't blame people who are overwhelmed and are confused because things are complicated because I felt the same way. Literally felt the same way just a couple of days ago. This is my first time SQL bits. First time in Europe. First time in London. First time to dry. And I grew up uh, I grew up knowing how to drive where the driver's side is on the left side of the car and the road's on the right side. It's a, bit of, uh, it's a bit confusing because I know how it felt like. It's intimidating. I've already imagined how it looked like it would look like if I hop into the car and start driving. I may, uh, I may hit somebody. I don't know. But it's intimidating. It's, it's frustrating. It's stressful. Driving is complex. It's complicated. But then... You, you start to get used to it, right? It's not just about the cars, it's about the roads. I might go to the right side of the road instead of the correct side of the road. So it's complicated. And, and I totally understand people who are confused and, and oblivious about Windows failover clustering or clustering in general because, again, a lot of moving parts, a lot of complications, people think it's really complicated. But then I realize something. I don't have to be intimidated because I actually know a few things. A few things. I know how to drive. I know how to, I know how to step on the gas. I know how to signal. I know how to press the brakes. I know how to read traffic signs. And I know how to read traffic lights. I actually know a few things. And, and, and for people who are starting off 
Understanding what Windows Failover clustering is, I start off with the idea, the secret to understanding complex concepts. Let's really go down to basics and start with what we already know. If there's one thing to keep in mind is to go back to the things that we already know and use that as a foundation to learn the basics. If you look at the abstract or the de description for the session, it's all about how the complexity of Windows failover clustering actually boils down to the simple things. Let's start by defining what high availability is, and I've got this definition. The goal of high availability is to keep systems, applications, and services readily available. We'll nail down to that definition, and every time, I like, I like definitions a lot. I like going to the dictionary and trying to find out the definition of something. Because by understanding what the definition is, it answers a lot of questions about how complicated things and how complex things are. And if there's one, key, uh, one takeaway that I want you guys uh, to have in the session is that failure clustering is simple. I may be overstating things, but you realize one thing. Something as complex as failover clustering can be as simple as understanding the basics. I keep telling my kids, before you can even do uh, uh, engineering mathematics, you have to know the basic math. Same thing with failover clustering. I talked about driving earlier and being so brave about driving for the first time here. And failover clustering, every time I look at failover clustering, every time I have to deal with failover clustering, I picture a traffic light, because basically that's what it is. If you go back and refer to a Windows service, a service has to stop and a service has to start. When you talk about failover clustering, I imagine things like I'm trying to stop a service, I'm trying to wait and start the service. Now you might be thinking, isn't that oversimplification? Well, it is some sort, but let's see how failover clustering works. Imagine a group of computers, and we'll go down to the definitions later. Imagine a, a group of computers working as a group. You got shared storage. You got all the services running in one computer. And this is where the stop, wait, start service comes into the picture. Imagine one of the servers in the cluster going down. Of course, once that server goes down, no application can run off of it. No connections can be made through it. What happens then? Of course, the heartbeat thing kicks in, realizes that one of the servers are down. The stop service kicks in. It waits. Waits for what? Waits until everything moves to one of the servers available in the cluster. Starts the service and then allows traffic to go back in. At a high level, that's how failover clustering works. And understanding that and understand, understanding some of the definitions that I'm going to explain later on, again, simplifies the concept that even when you're trying to deal with 16 nodes or 4 nodes or 2 node cluster, you just have to go, to, go back to the basics. I grabbed this definition of a cluster and a couple of things to highlight about a cluster. Number one, it's a group of computers and storage devices. Not one, but a group of computers. Because the goal is to make your services highly available. So it has to be more than one. They work together. I can't pull an HP DL whatever with an IBM server, two separate servers, and call them a cluster if they're not working together. They have to be working together as a single system. Keep that definition in mind, because once we start talking about the other terms and concepts in failover clustering, we'll always go back to this main definition. They have to be a group of computers working together, interacting as a single system. Let's take a look at definitions. First, node. What is a node? It's a server that's a member of a cluster. I mentioned earlier, you can't just pull in one HP box and one IBM box and treat them as a cluster if they're not working together. I can't call them nodes if they're not working together. So a node is a server that is acting as a member server in a cluster. 
What is a resource? A resource is a hardware, a service, or an entity that's hosted on a cluster. That could be anything. That could be a drive. That could be a name. That could be an IP address. Now, I mentioned earlier that we, on, we only need to go back to the basics of what we already know. Imagine a standalone instance. One SQL Server instance running off of a standalone server. What do you have there? Well, you got to have disks. Because your SQL Server databases will be running off of disks, right? You got to have a service or SQL Server is running as a service. We DBAs don't consider the host name as a resource because by default, a SQL Server instance name, if it's a default instance, will use the host name. So we don't really pay attention to the host name and the IP address. The thing is, how do your clients connect to your cluster if we don't have a, ver a, a, a host name and an IP address? Those are resources. Think of those components as resources in a cluster. The only difference, they don't just run off of one machine. They can be moved between machines. The basic building block of a cluster is what will give you some insights on how a cluster works. And again, I went back to the idea of having a standalone SQL Server instance, talking about disks, host names, IP addresses, and services. And again, if you're looking at a standalone instance, you don't really look at it that way. All we know is we install SQL because everything's there. As long as we have the disks, we're ready. What DBAs uh, care mo most about will be the disk and the service. That's it, right? But in a cluster, everything about SQL Server is a resource. Now, there are two types of resources. One's called a physical resource, something that's tangible. When I say tangible, you might be thinking, well, what if it's a VM? It's still a physical resource, even if it's a VM, if your member server is a VM, because it's still running on a physical host. You got storage, you can touch, you can feel it. Your network, and of course, your server nodes, okay? And again, you might argue I could have virtual machines as my uh, nodes in my cluster, but the thing is, your virtual servers will st still run off of a physical host. And then you have a virtual resource. Virtual resources are simply entities that represent something. They don't really exist, technically, because you can't associate that with something tangible, but they exist for a purpose, just like a virtual server name. Technically, a virtual server name is no different from a computer host name. You'll have a computer host name in Active Directory, you'll have a computer host name in the, your DNS. But the thing is, a virtual server name is a floating entity. Just like a standalone SQL Server instance, you will have a host name for the machine. For a clustered SQL Server instance, you will have a virtual server name. Of course, the instance name will be added on top of that. And then you have the virtual IP address. Of course, how can you get to the host name if you don't have an IP address? So the virtual IP address maps to the virtual server name or what Active Directory calls the virtual computer object. You still with me? These things we don't really pay attention to if we're dealing with standalone instances. They're actually there. You have your host name, you have your IP address, they're there. So you got physical, you got virtual, and then you got a resource group. How many of you here have worked with Windows Server 2003 clusters? And you might be wondering, I think I know where this guy's coming from because he's still using resource groups. I like using resource groups. It's a combination of resources that are managed as a unit. We never think of a disk in a SQL Server instance that's totally separate from the SQL Server service, the host name, and the IP address. 
You don't take away the hard drive and expect everything to work. Of course, you don't take away the IP address and expect everything to work. You don't take away the SQL Server service on a standalone instance and expect everything to work. They act as a unit. You with me? That's why when you do a migration, you don't take away the hard drive and put it on a separate server and works flawlessly. You can't. You have to move everything with it. What does that mean? You have to move the database, and the database is stored on a local drive. You have to move the IP address, of course, because your connections have to go through that same IP address. You move everything as a unit. Like I said, we don't look at it that way from a standalone uh, SQL Server instance. But in a clustered instance, we look at, uh, look at them as a group, which means if I need to move my service from one member server to another member server, everything has to move. The disks, the network, the service, and the IP address. I kind of look at this as your uh, utility. What does that mean? You got your phones, you got internet subscription at home. If you decide to move from, say, London to somewhere else, you don't bring your phone with you and not change your billing address. It has to move with you. So if you're changing address, you have to change your billing address because at the end of the day, if you don't change your billing address, it will still go back to your old residence. And of course, nobody will be paying for your bills. I mean, that would be good, no? You're using your phone and nobody's paying for it. But the thing is, if you don't pay your bills in time, you get disconnected, which means your bills will have to go with the service, whether it's, it's phone, cable subscription or internet subscription, same thing. With resource groups, when you move a service or a disk from one member server to the other, they have to go as a group. I asked how many of you here have worked with Windows Server 2003, because Windows Server 2003, they call them resource groups. In earlier version of Windows, they call them resource groups. I don't know what came, uh, uh, what what the marketing people are thinking when they started calling them services and applications in Windows Server 2008. And in Windows Server 2012, they started calling them roles. Jeez, can we not be consistent about things? I still like to call them resource groups because of the concepts behind it, services and applications. Well, most people don't think of services as a group or a group of resources. That's why I, like, I still like calling them resource groups. And then the concept of a failover is moving a clustered resource from one member server or one node to another. And when you talk about failover, everything ties in together because now you're dealing with one clustered resource that's being hosted in a resource group, which means I can't just move one service from one server to another. I have to move everything that goes with that resource in that group and move them to another member server. So with me? And then dependencies, which is the reliance of one resource upon another. And this is very much familiar when you talk about SQL Server Agent and SQL Server Service, because the SQL Server Agent will not start if the SQL Server Service has not started. It has its dependencies on the SQL Server Service. But we don't realize some of these things that the SQL Server service is actually dependent on your drives. Try corrupting one of your, your storage drives where SQL Server is running and you'll be surprised the SQL <coughs> Server will not start. But there's a dependency that's not explicitly made, well, we're not specific, uh, explicitly made aware of the dependency, but there is a dependency between the drives and the SQL Server service in a standalone instance. There's also a dependency on the IP address. Why? Well, if you got a duplicate IP address, you'll realize that you keep seeing this prompt in Windows saying you got a duplicate IP address, and then SQL Server service sometimes doesn't work properly, w properly with a duplicate IP address. But these dependencies exist without us knowing them, but they're there. Right? And then there's the quorum. 
past couple of concepts of, I've talked about have a lot of things in common with a standalone instance. You know, how the resource works, because now you have a service as a resource, how the dependencies work, but Quorum is something specific to a cluster. And I got this definition off of Wikipedia. It's the minimum number of members of, a, of an assembly, or simply put, I, I want to keep this simple. Majority vote wins. I mentioned earlier that a cluster is a group, not one, but a group of computers. Each of those computers will have a vote. And those votes will decide who gets to run the SQL Server resource group. If you got two cluster, uh, cluster nodes, you need to have a majority in order for you to uh, decide, or in order for the cluster to decide who gets to run that particular uh, service or cluster resource. How do, you, how do you decide if you have an even number of votes? Because half of that is not a majority. 50-50 is not a majority. This is where you start introducing the concept of quorum. Windows Server 2003 required, and earlier, it required that you must have a disk for your quorum. The only thing that, this, uh, that the disk does is to provide a vote. Because now you have two nodes plus a disk. If one of those entities go down, if one server goes down or the quorum drive goes down, you still have a majority, two out of three. Windows Server 2008 changed that because now you can have a file share as a quorum. Now think of it this way, the quorum is just a vote. Majority of votes win. And the votes will decide who gets to run a cluster. Now, there are two hardware requirements for building a cluster. I know people are cringing when I say this. I mentioned I hated clustering in the past, primarily because I have to know by heart the hardware compatibility list. Which means if I have, if I have an HP machine, I need to have all the member nodes in my cluster to have the exact same configuration, the exact same hardware, the exact same software, exact same firmware, the exact same everything in order for them to work. Oh, what's worse? Another vendor just popped in a, a firmware update and now they're not the same. They have to have the same BIOS. That is a big headache. Not anymore. In Windows Server 2008, and this is something that I really appreciate uh, uh, from the product team at Microsoft, for making things simple. First requirement is as long as you have that logo, whether it's for Windows 2008 or Windows Server 2012, as long as you have that logo, you're good to go. Now you might be asking, what if my nodes are virtual machine. Well, as long as your physical host is certified to run Windows, you're covered. The second one will be the failover cluster validation report. I love this. Because it does the work that I need to do. You know, back in the days, oh, I have this network adapter. It has this brand. It, this, it uses this firmware. I have to check Microsoft's website if it it passes the hardware compatibility list. If it doesn't, throw in a new hardware and see if that passes. This does the job for me. It checks for everything. And the goal is to have a check mark on everything. How many of you here have, uh, have, have run this before? How many of you here love this? I love this. It's one of the reasons why I went back to doing a failover clustering. Two Requirements. You get past both, you're covered. Which means Microsoft will officially support your cluster. Okay. Now you might see warnings. I recommend fixing the error messages before moving forward. I recommend addressing the warnings. But if you're aware of the warnings, for example, that the patches do not match between nodes, it's okay. Those are just patches. Unlike before, if there are mismatches between nodes, you're probably uh, not going to be sure if the cluster will work. This one assures you that if it's just a warning, it will work and it is supported. I, again, I don't recommend uh, 
running your cluster, if you have warnings, I'd rather fix those warnings before proceeding. All right. People laugh at me when I tell them this. I'm old school. I still write on paper. A checklist is something that I always refer to whenever I build clusters. I do a lot of SharePoint deployments with always on availability groups as their backend databases, and I still give them this. It's an Excel spreadsheet. It tells me uh, the cluster nodes, what the version of Windows I'm running on, are they physical, are they virtual, how much RAM do I have, and what they are for. Each tab represents something. So this is just for the server, and I have my network. What for? This is for the network guys. Fill me in, I need to have the IP address for the physical uh, network cards, I need to have the virtual IP address for my cluster, because I want to have everything in hand or on hand when I start building my cluster. I don't have to wait for the network guys to provide me with the details, because I have everything in here. And I'm using iSCSI, by the way, for my testing. Uh, storage. You don't need to be the storage guy, but you definitely need to know what the LUNs are for, how much storage you're, you're provided for, what do you need to use them for, what the capacity is, and so on and so forth. And as I mentioned, you don't need to be the storage guy to do this, but you need to know what they are for. Services. What services are running on my cluster? I put SQL Server in there because we're DBAs, we're SQL Server professionals, but I can run Exchange off of that. As long as the service is cluster aware and it's supported to run Windows failover clustering, you're covered. Okay. One of the reasons why SQL Server is a popular product to run Windows failover clustering is because it's cluster aware, similar to Microsoft Exchange. And of course, my SQL Server services. You don't put passwords in Excel spreadsheets and send them to your colleague. A lot of people do that. Done with the talk, let's do a demo, quick demo. Uh, I have a VM here and I have two standalone machines that I want to join as part of a cluster. It's pretty straightforward to do that. But the first thing that I need to do is to enable the failover clustering feature. And there are a couple of things uh, a couple of ways to do that. One is to use the add roles and features option using server manager. And it's, like I said, it's pretty easy. Makes things easy for the administrator to go ahead, turn on the feature, and build a cluster. That's straightforward. I already have uh, failover clustering installed because I, it, this one takes a lot of time on my machine. So that's one way to install the failover clustering feature using server manager and check that out. You probably realize that I don't really like the GUI that much. There's also a PowerShell commandlet to do it. Install uh, Windows feature, failover clustering, include and I'm a lazy guy, that's why I like PowerShell, because I can just tab into the different options. I don't have to type everything. So two options, you can enable the Windows failover clustering feature via PowerShell, or if you still like the GUI, Server Manager. Once the failover clustering feature is turned on, and make sure that it is turned on on all of the uh, servers in your potential cluster, all the potential members in your cluster, then we can start building the cluster. Right. Since I already have the failover clustering feature installed on my, all of my nodes, well, I only have two nodes in my example here, I can start building my cluster. But I can't just build my cluster without going through the process of validating the cluster. And this is where the failover of cluster validation wizard comes in very handy. And like I said, there are two ways to do this, one of which is via the failover cluster manager. Fired it up, uh, fired up uh, select the different nodes, select the different tests, and then off you go. For example, I want to include cluster three, and I'm not very creative with names, 
cluster 3, WBS cluster 4, and that's that. You can add as many nodes here, depending on your uh, on the version of Windows that you're using. But keep in mind, though, it is recommended to run this before you build a cluster. Why? This is your seal for Microsoft that guarantees you that they're going to support your cluster. Even if you're uh, adding a new hardware, for example, say you're adding a backup network adapter just to run your backups off from, run this. Click Next. And I want to show you this. The recommended approach is all to run all the tests if you're building a new cluster. But just to show you exactly what the wizard is running, take a look at this. It's checking for your storage, failing the storage over and back. Just want to validate if your storage are indeed cluster aware. Then you got your system, all the different tests for your system, the BIOS information, memory, and so on and so forth. What else do we have here? The network, binding order, IP configuration, and so on and so forth. Everything that you have to worry about in the past and checking whether or not they pass the uh, Microsoft hardware compatibility list. And then you got the storage and a system configuration. And again, as I mentioned, for new clusters, make sure that you run the failover cluster validation wizard. This is gonna take quite a while on my laptop, it's a bit slow, but I've already done this. Another approach to do, that, uh, to do is again to use uh, PowerShell to do it. And the reason I like this is because it's as simple as typing the cluster nodes. Done. I don't have to go through the wizard, I just have to type it. Again, that's one of the reasons I like the command line. And I've already done it. Once, once the failover cluster validation wizard has completed, it will prepare and create a report under Windows Cluster Reports in the Failover Cluster Validation Wizard generates an MHT uh, file and this is what we really need. We want everything to return successful results. That's our goal. If you see any warning, fix it. Most people will say, nah, I totally understand what I'm going through. I hope. Windows Server 2008 only needs one network adapter for clustering and it works. It's being flagged as a warning, I don't have to fix it. Keep in mind though, even if Windows Server 2008 and higher supports failover clustering with one network adapter, you go back to the main definition of what high availability is. And there's always this argument of, do I need a heartbeat network, do I need this? Skip the argument, go back to the definition. What is it for? It's for high availability. You got one network adapter. I don't care if it's NIC themed. I don't care if there's four network cards themed. If you don't have high availability, don't waste your time building a cluster. You go back to the definition, you wanna make your systems highly available. That is the goal. The goal is to make sure that all of these return successful results. Okay? Once you're done with that, you can always uh, create the cluster. And I want to highlight a couple of things. Cluster 3, Cluster 4. This is where your Excel spreadsheet comes into the picture. I so love going back to the Excel spreadsheet and looking at the items in my Excel spreadsheet and go, ooh, this is the name the virtual server name is the IP address. People ask me when I do this presentation, are you just guessing IP addresses because you, you own the network? No, I have them documented. Oh, we all love documentation, don't we? So I know I can use win cluster two. And uh, 211. Like I said, I didn't make that up. I didn't just guess the name and the IP. It's documented. 
once you have the virtual IP address, once you have the virtual server name, click next and the cluster will be created for you. We already talked about this earlier. You got your cluster name, which is your virtual server name. You got your IP address and then the members, member nodes of your cluster. We don't pay attention to this when we, again, install SQL Server on a standalone instance. Because we assume that the server has to have a host name, it has to have an IP address, so I don't really care. But keep in mind, that's your host name and that's your IP address. It's just running off of Windows failover cluster. Click next. So now you have a Windows failover cluster. Things don't stop there. Think of this as the Windows part of it. Because you can't install SQL Server failover cluster instance if you don't have a Windows failover cluster. I always tell people Windows SQL Server failover clustering instance is not a SQL Server technology. It's a Windows technology. SQL Server is just leveraging on the fact that it's already there and let's just use it. Same thing why, uh, why always on availability groups is built with Windows failover clustering in mind. You can't build always on availability groups without Windows failover clustering. Woo, that was quick. That was, for those of you who's, who, who's, who's done this with Windows Server 2003, how long did it take for you to create a cluster back then? Oh, there's a corrupted resource, oops. And I haven't even built my cluster. Oh, my disks are not working and I haven't built my cluster yet. On average, I spent like three days, my, my best ever two to three days building a Windows Server 2003 cluster. Two minutes. Of course, that's on assumption that everything's already laid out for you, the disks are fine, you're, you're, everything's fine. That's why I had my, my, again, that's why I had my Excel spreadsheet. Then I can talk to the network guy and tell them, how come my cluster is not being built? You don't have a virtual IP address for me. Why don't you provision one for me so that I can do my job? And it's pretty straightforward. Now you have a failover cluster, a Windows failover cluster, which means now you can start installing SQL Server on top of this. It saw a couple of drives, clustered drives, or clustered or, or drives that are capable of being clustered. So now I have those, and they took those drives into the failover cluster so that now I can install SQL Server and use those clustered drives. You might be wondering where the heck is the quorum thing coming in? I didn't see anything about the quorum as I was building my Windows cluster. Anybody of you wondered? Guess? Take a guess. It sets up. It sets up automatically. You can go change it afterwards. Windows failover clustering is smart enough to pick one of the disks as a cluster. Cluster quorum, rather. And it picked my uh, cluster disk to drive. Let's expand this. So I got two nodes. Uh, I got my network adapters. I didn't realize my uh, VM's that slow. So I got two nodes, cluster three and cluster four. They're both uh, uh, member servers in my cluster node. No, in my cluster, rather. Keep mixing the terms. Then I got my storage. If you talk about the quorum, back in the days you have to define the disks that you're gonna use for your quorum. Now Windows will pick and choose on the available disks. So if you provided 10 disks, Windows will pick and choose which one of those disks will be used as a cluster quorum drive. Yes, question. Happened in 2008, okay. How did it make that choice? And this is one thing that you have to, keep, have to keep in mind because when you're planning your storage, you either forget about the fact that Windows already chose the quorum drive for you or you have to be intentional about designing how you provision your lunch for your cluster or you have to do it yourself manually. So in my case, I've got two cluster drives. Now again, I'm just talking about Windows here. I got two cluster drives, but it already picked that drive as my quorum drive or 
what Windows now calls a disk witness in quorum. How did it choose the right drive? It chooses based on disk number. Not the size, the disk number. So think of it this way. If you're provisioning 20 gigabytes to your first disk, Windows will actually take that 20 gigabytes and convert that into a quorum drive. Sheesh, I only need 512 megabytes for my quorum drive back in the days. I don't need 20 gigabytes. So how do you fix that? This is where, as you were mentioning, manually fix that quorum by selecting the proper disk. If you're using quorum drives for your uh, quorum configuration, I try not to use quorum drives nowadays because the storage drives are very expensive, especially if you're using EMC or those high-end drives. So I use file share witness. But let's say you're still using quorum drives. We can just change the quorum witness and use a disk witness. And this is what I was mentioning earlier about configuring a file share. I, I love the fact that I don't have to use a, cl a cluster drive for this. Imagine a multi-subnet or multi-site clustering. I don't have to replicate a one gigabyte drive across the network just so I can have a quorum. I can use a file share if I want to. Disk and change that instead of using disk two, well, it already chose disk two. I can change that if I want to, but in this case, it already chose disk two because I intentionally provisioned the LUN, the first disk in my LUN, to be the one gigabyte drive. And you can change this by using the cluster configuration settings. Okay. Question so far on building a Windows failover cluster. I told you that's easy, but it doesn't come easy without proper planning. Proper planning is the key why it's as quick as a two minute click, click, click and done. Yes, question? If you start off with a disk, a quorum disk, but you want to switch to file um, quorum after that, is that, well, I assume it's possible from the wizard there, is there any sort of downsides, any gotchas you need to be aware of? Uh, it's a question of how is your cluster configured. If you're, if you're looking at a multi-site cluster, two node cluster in production, the extra node in DR, so that if your entire data center go down, you still have one node to take over. Question is, how do you want to define your quorum? Do you want to define a quorum that uses a quorum drive? Where is the quorum drive going to reside? Is it going to reside on the production side or on the DR side? So it's a question of what are you trying to accomplish? The main reason before why they had a quorum drive is because they just need a quorum. It's actually, well, if you look at the TechNet documentation, it says 512 megs. But the thing is, I can't resize it lower than one gig. That's my, that's my main challenge. See, I'm provided with a one gigabyte drive and I can't do anything with the 512 megabytes. What am I gonna do with that? Oh, store MP3 files maybe. Oh, and I'm, by the way, I'm gonna replicate that over if I'm gonna do multi-site clustering. So it doesn't make sense for me. The good thing about this is now Microsoft is providing you with an option to use a file share, something that can be accessed by all of the nodes in your cluster. That's a cheap solution. If you have a high avail uh, highly available file share, might as well use that. Very nice question. The question was, can you actually specify your quorum while you're setting up the cluster? You probably noticed I wasn't provided with that option with the wizard, but you can do it in PowerShell. Okay. The, again, the key thing there is planning. What do you really want to use for your quorum? Do you want to use a node majority? Node majority simply means that you don't have an, uh, you don't have an even number of nodes. Three nodes, for example, you got node majority. Five, you got node majority. I got even number of nodes. I need something to break the number of votes. I could use a disk, I could use a file share. Now the decision would always sometimes revolve around how much are you willing to pay versus what are you trying to accomplish and how complex your architecture may start to be. And again, that's how things would look like as far as failover, Windows failover clustering is concerned. It's that easy, but it doesn't come free. You have to plan for it, you have to provision for it. The only reason I can do it in three minutes is because I've already planned for it. 
And don't ever bother fixing a broken cluster <coughs> if it's not live yet. Please. There's no sense fixing this. If it's your test environment, go ahead, break it and fix it. But if you're provisioning a new cluster that's designed for one of your highly critical servers, break the cluster, create a new one. The last thing you want is worrying about supporting it down the road. And again, going back to the main definition, what is the cluster for? The goal is for high availability. I don't want to be fixing that because if I fix that, I have downtime. Simple as that. And of course, I wrote a four-part series article on, uh, some of you may have probably seen this. I wrote a four-part series article on mssqltips.com on how to build a SQL Server 2008 failover cluster on Windows Server 2008. The concepts are the same. They didn't change. They're still there, all documented. They ended up being one of the most popular uh, articles for the past two years simply because they have screenshots, they explain everything there, there is, and most people use the, this as their run book. They just change the screenshots and the values, but they use this as, and I'm happy that they're, they're doing that because Microsoft documentation sucks. Uh, uh, key things, you don't just click on install when you're firing up the installation media. You have to select the new failover cluster uh, installation option. Now, Imagine you have three nodes, gone are the days, SQL 2005 and earlier, gone are the days when you have to install a SQL failover cluster and wait and cross your fingers that nothing ever happens. Okay? The worst part of that is installing patches because if you install a patch, it has to be on the node that's running the service and then push it on all of the nodes and wait and pray that nothing ever happens. Because if it, something does happen, prepare to restore from backups. And I'm happy that Microsoft did that because it may take longer, but my applications don't go down longer. So you start installing uh, the media, or you start firing up the installation media, install the bits on the first node, and then you have SQL Server running on that node. I now have a fully functioning SQL Server failover cluster. I said fully functioning. Yes, why fully functioning? Because now you can create a database in it, you can configure it, you can have your applications connect to it, it's fully functioning, the question is. And of course, I, 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 a couple of things I wanna highlight. Windows Server 2012 allows you to store tempdb on a local drive. Because TempDB used to be required, uh, it was in, uh, required to be installed on the shared drive or on a clustered drive. My question with Microsoft before was, does it really make sense to move that and store that on an expensive drive when it's going to be recreated upon SQL Server Restart? Answer that question yourself. Is it worth the cost, the configuration and everything to store tempdb on a shared drive and then get recreated every time. Because technically, SQL Server will stop the service, right? Move the resource group to another member server and start the service. Wait a second, tempdb gets recreated every SQL Server restarts. So that's exactly what's happening. So now, Microsoft gave you the option to store tempdb on a local drive, and that's what I have in my configuration, but it gives you the warning, it's just a warning, telling you that you're storing tempdb on a local drive. I think that's awesome. But there are some caveats. You need to provide permissions, you make sure that the folder structure is the same between the nodes or all of the nodes, but I love the fact that you can store tempdb on a local drive, it's faster. Going back to what I mentioned earlier, you now have a fully functioning SQL Server failover cluster instance. Question is, is it highly available? No, really. It's working, it's functioning, but it's not highly available. And again, going back to our definition of high availability, we want the services to be highly available. And I mentioned you can install the database, you can connect your application, and it works. Try failing it over to the other node, it won't work. 
because there are no SQL Server uh, binaries installed in there. It's just there. So what do you do? You go through the process of adding nodes into the SQL Server failover cluster. Keep in mind, you already have a Windows failover cluster working, but your SQL Server instance is not highly available. This is where you start adding nodes to the SQL Server instance. You add nodes, to the, uh, you add, install SQL Server on a second node. The thing about Windows Server, uh, SQL Server 2012 is it also now gives you the option because now you're, it's supported to run on multi-subnet clusters. Think about that. Three node clusters, two nodes on production, one node in DR. You have a multi-subnet cluster. Back in the days, you have to have a stretched VLAN in order for you to configure a multi-subnet cluster for SQL Server. Windows Server 2008 supported that, but not SQL Server. 2012 gave you that option to do multi-subnet clustering out of the box. No more stretch cluster, no more arguing with the network guys that we need stretch VLANs. It's supported out of the box. And then you continue installing SQL Server on all the nodes uh, in your Windows Server cluster. And that's the, on that's the only time that your SQL Server instance is highly available. I got calls from some of our customers telling me, how come my SQL Server failover clustered instance doesn't fail over? I did exactly what your, uh, what your articles uh, uh, told me to do. And I asked the question, did you actually install the binaries on the nodes? You answer that question for yourself. Uh, you probably figured that they haven't. And again, I wrote part three of that to highlight how you go about installing SQL Server on the other nodes and joining them into the already existing SQL Server failover cluster instance. What about service packs? Service packs, and I mentioned earlier, go back to the SQL 2005 days, install service pack, cross your fingers and pray nothing happens. The bad part of that is if something did happen, good luck. Store everything from backups and uh, there goes your downtime. A lot of people complain about how service packs are being installed in SQL Server 2008 and higher because you have to start with the non-active node. I don't want to call it active passive. I want to call it the active and non-active because what do you call a multi-instance cluster in a failover cluster instance? Do you call it active, active, passive? An active, passive, passive? How do you call it? So I just call it active and non-active. So install the service pack on the non-active node first until you're done. Technically, your SQL Server instance is still up and running, but it's not highly available at that point. So you don't patch your non-active nodes all at the same time. You do it one at a time. And again, a lot of people complain about this because it's more work. Imagine patching a four instance uh, four node, four instance running on a, a Windows cluster. You do it 16 times every time. But the goal, again, is high availability, right? And like I said, I like this. If, if this node screws up, I can just remove it from the node, add a new one, fix it. No downtime. No crossing my fingers and praying nothing worse happens, right? Once you're done, you move the clustered instance to the other node, and then you patch that instance, or node rather. Okay. And again, I wrote a, a, a part four of that on MS SQL tips. The reason I'm saying all of this is because most people ask, do you have nodes? Can I copy it? Can I download the slides? I've got everything already uh, uh, online and available for you guys. One more thing, you probably saw me do a lot of PowerShell stuff. I love PowerShell. Uh, Windows Server 2008 started with a concept of Windows Server Core. And now SQL Server 2012, if you were uh, at the, our Genesis uh, session yesterday about Windows Server Core, you know for a fact that SQL Server can now be installed on Windows Server Core. What does that mean? Higher availability because I don't have to worry about patches. I mean Windows patches, I still need to worry about SQL patches, but not Windows patches. Provided higher availability and prevented Windows guys from getting into the box. They can't screw up something that they don't know. And that's what I like about it. So you can't really get away from PowerShell and scripting. So I, you probably saw me do a lot of, not a lot, but some PowerShell scripts, which is very, very useful for me. 
Next steps is try everything on your laptop. Gone are the days when you, you, when you tell people, I can't do clustering because I don't have an expensive SAN, I don't have an expen expensive storage, I don't have this and I don't have that. I'm using a third-party iSCSI product called Starwind software. You can use, if you have an MSDN or TechNet subscription, you can use Windows Storage Server. Build your cluster, use my documentation, try it, test it. It's that easy. Going back to all the definitions and all the concepts that we talked about, I wanna highlight one thing, uh, and this is only gonna take one minute. I said one minute, yes. Is how my Windows or rather my SQL Server failover cluster now works, and this is what I like about this. Well, now they call them roles. But this is what I like about this. You can have the uh, dependency report. Documentation, documentation. You can grab this, use it as part of your run book. And what I like about this is it explains the different concepts that we talked about earlier, about the dependencies, the resources, and so on and so forth, in a graphical way. Now oh, that's cool. I know for a fact that my SQL Server agent is dependent on my SQL Server service, and it's also dependent on my physical drives and my network name. My network name is dependent on an IP address. So what happens, part of the troubleshooting process, what happens if one of my resources don't go online? You just refer to this graphic and check what's wrong. If my SQL Server service is not going online, maybe I need to check the disks. Maybe I need to check the network name. Maybe I need to check the IP address, right? And what I want to show you in less than a minute is to show you how things work when you do a failover. Remember, we talk about failover. You're moving this resource group from one member server to another member server in the cluster. Move this to currently running on node one, run it in node two, see how everything behaves. This is dependent on this. So this is the first thing to go offline. This is dependent on the drives. Once this goes offline, drives go offline and they're being moved to the other node. Once this is offline, you see that my IP address is the first thing to go online because it doesn't have any dependencies at all. That the name goes online after this because it's dependent on this. And this is where the concepts of a resource group and resource and dependencies all come together and graphically represented by this. Very great documentation. Your failover cluster validation wizard provides you with a report. Grab it, print it out, put it in your run book. Same thing with the dependency report. Part of the troubleshooting process, it makes life easy for you. How'd you like it? Wow. One of the reasons I went back and started doing clustering after hating it for years. Question so far. Windows Server Core is what I call the Windows version of Unix. It's Windows without Windows. So it's all command line, except for, the fa except for the fact that you can open up Notepad and Task Manager, some control panels. But because you don't have GUI stuff on it, you don't need to patch anything that depends on the GUI. Less patching. In fact, uh, statistics from Microsoft say they've only installed less of about 30 to 40 patches uh, on Windows Server Core compared to the total of 100% patches that they install on regular Windows. So that brings down the, the uh, downtime or increases the availability. Uh, again, my uh, email, my blog. Uh, if you do have any questions, I'm available. Thank you for coming. A couple of things to consider. Uh, it's 9, 10, 9, 0, 9. Uh, ETL power, I, I totally recommend going through this uh, session, primarily because I'm a PowerShell guy. Uh, if you have any questions with failover clustering or PowerShell, feel free to send me an email or talk to me after the session. I'll be more than happy unless you do have questions right now. Very nice question. 
The question was, do you recommend remo removing it from the node? Not removing it, but removing it from the preferred owners list so that it doesn't fail over to that. And it's actually a good practice. Alan Hurt, one of the clustering MVPs, actually wrote a, a document on how to perform that. So you're basically taking, not taking it out of the node, but just removing it from the preferred owners list. And uh, uh, there's a checkbox to do that. That way, it doesn't fail over accidentally to that node. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? Questions, questions. Yes, question. I, like I said, I mentioned this earlier. If you have a screwed up installation the first time and it's not live, don't fix it. But is it is Build it, up a new one. Is, is it because I've screwed up the SQL running stuff or is it because the cluster set up? In some cases, it's a combination of both. When you do the uninstall, sometimes it doesn't remove entries in the registry and that screws things up. Can I be really mean? We've got five minutes to start the next session. Can we carry on the conversation sure. with that song? Sure. So I'm, I'm going to be outside. Uh, again, thank you for coming. I really appreciate you guys coming here at 8 o'clock. Well, that's why I'm already done.